Are you or someone you know struggling with psychosis? Then stick around because in this episode of the Mental Health Toolbox, we're interviewing Maggie Mullen, author, speaker, trainer, and therapist on their new book, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy Skills Workbook for Psychosis. So let's go. Hello Thrivers and welcome back to the Mental Health Toolbox. My name is Patrick Martin and I am on a mission to help 1 million people improve their quality of life with actionable skills on personal development. So let's do it. Maggie Mullen is a clinical social worker, national trainer, community activist, and author of the Dialectical Behavior Therapy Skills Workbook for Psychosis. Maggie specializes in culturally responsive evidence-based care for psychotic spectrum disorders, trauma, and PTSD, the LGBTQ plus community, and formerly incarcerated people. As a training director at Kaiser Permanente, they take great pride in mentoring, training, and supervising the next generation of social workers. You can find them online at www.maggiemullen.com. All right. Welcome, Maggie, to the Mental Health Toolbox podcast. So glad you could make it today. It's an honor and a privilege to have you on. Um, I'm really excited about this interview because DBT is something uh, I'm personally fond of having been trained in DBT and led individual group counseling for DBT for a couple of years. I was really excited when I saw your book hit the shelves, DBT for Psychosis. But before we jump in, I just want to briefly reintroduce you to our listeners. Uh, You are a trainer, author, consultant, therapist. Did I miss anything? You got it all. (laughs) There are many hats. Excellent. Excellent. So we're going to dive into all of that. And uh, this is going to be fun. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Thanks for having me, Patrick. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and uh, start us off by letting us know a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, You did a great job. Uh, I I am a, a typical social worker in the sense that I do a lot of different things as a way of keeping myself active and excited and working on different levels. So um, as you mentioned, I wrote a book recently called the Dialectical Behavioral Therapy Skills Workbook for Psychosis. So DBT Skills Workbook for short. Um, And that's my most recent endeavor. And um, I'm also a therapist. I work uh, mostly with folks with psychotic spectrum disorders. I also do gender specialty work. So working with our gender non-conforming and transgender populations here in the Bay Area in California. So I've gotten into doing trainings recently as well. So feeling like I'm kind of spreading my wings into lots of different areas, which has been really very fun for me. Yeah, you've covered a lot of ground. And I love how you just say, oh, I just wrote a book. Like, no big deal. You know, just (laughs) pack that onto the end there. That takes some time, right? Yeah, the time, energy, tears. I mean, all of it. I I think I didn't necessarily set out uh, as a social worker to write a book. And I actually got recruited to write it, which was kind of a cool phenomenon. Um, and it turns out writing a book is just as hard as you think it is. I really, you know, not a surprise probably to most people out there in the world, but I was like, yeah, I could write a realist. book. <laughs> yeah, just felt like, yeah, sure, we can figure it out, and then I realized, like, oh, it's, it is a ton of time, not just writing the things you're excited about, but editing, painstakingly, copy the editing, going over the same things over and over again, um, which is the least glamorous part, I think, of the process, but it's so cool at the end of the the whole journey to have a physical manifestation of this thing that you've been working on for years. And so that like really um, warmed my heart when I got to see the first copy of my book. And actually my parents were the first people somehow who got a copy of my book. I have no idea why, but they got shipped it for be. me. And it was very like, yeah, this seems right. <laughs> no small thing to write a book. And then I'm sure it's a fantastic feeling to have it in, in its true form completed. Then you have to launch it which is a whole other task, right? That is exactly right, yes. So um, what I learned in this process is that there are about a million books that get published in the US alone every year. And so part of what you're trying to do as an author is sell your book, right? Like market it, tell people about it, get it into the hands of people who could benefit. And my book is really designed for like a, a relatively narrow population, right? People who are experiencing mm-hmm. psychosis, their loved ones or clinicians. Um, and that I think is a relatively narrow category meaning that I'm really having to do a lot of work to promote it and make sure it gets into the hands of the people who I think would benefit from the most ultimately. So 
that has been um, a learning process for me as well, in addition to the actual writing end and feeling like, okay, cool, it's done. This is actually where the real work starts, I think, is to help um, people understand it's a resource that could be useful to them. Absolutely, and we can all use pointed resources such as this. And, I, and I'm dying to ask, plug in ahead of ourselves here, but DBT skills for psychosis, that is like niche inside of a niche. Like, how did that happen? Um, I'll give you, I'll give you the, the immediate version, not the long version the short, or the short version of the story, but I um, ended up uh, kind of going into the niche that I ended up in because I was trained as a DBT therapist um, during graduate school. And particularly for me, I really got excited about DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy because not only is it a fantastically research driven um, intervention that really like literally helps save lives, but it's also an intervention that was created by and for the people it was meant to serve, right? So Dr. Marshall Linehan, the developer of DBT, has you know, spoken in recent years about being hospitalized for emotion regulation issues for self-harm or suicide attempts as a youth. And for me, I really got drawn to DBT because I wanted to have the input of somebody who would be like using this to be part of that story, right? For that disability justice lens of um, nothing about us without us, right? That we should have input as consumers into this. Mm -hmm. And so part of how we ended up or kind of marrying the worlds of DBT and psychosis was really to see there are so many carve outs in mental health for people with psychosis, right? Like so many programs the research and literature, even medication trials, things like that, there, you'll often see if you look, um, you know, not for people with active psychosis over and over again. And what we've seen is that this means that people are over sort of relying on institutionalization for people with psychosis or over medicating them. And, you know, there's been wonderful um, uses for medication. They have a huge, I think, part in the world of helping people with psychosis, but they are not the only thing that we know that people can benefit from psychotherapy. So for me, it was sort of about marrying these two worlds and figuring out how can we benefit people with psychosis by offering them skills that can actively intervene when that cycle of emotion dysregulation happens that we know worsens symptoms of psychosis. Yeah, and I haven't seen much, you know, in the way of evidence-based practices for psychosis other than CET for cognitive enhancement therapy, which is even that's relatively newish, you know, using social groups, no surprise, and computers and, you know, stimulus, right, for schizophrenia. And DBT skills, so this, is, this isn't just, per se, people with borderline personality disorder who struggle with psychosis. These skills you're saying are applicable to the gamut. That's what we're going for, yeah. Essentially, is. um, Certainly people, there's a, there's a big overlap between people who experience borderline personality disorder or, um, or like what we call like emotion dysregulation issues and psychosis. Like there's just a huge, um, like two kind of overlapping circles. Mm -hmm. And so what we found is that we already kind of knew that for people who also were experiencing emotion regulation, like BPD, um, they did really well in the trials uh, with uh, DBT therapy for folks who are also experiencing psychosis. And for people, who have psychotic spectrums alone, right? So schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, et cetera. Um, what we found more and more through like emerging literature and practice is that they really struggle with emotion regulation issues, but because they have experiencing those negative symptoms, like a flattened affect, difficulty connecting with emotion, et cetera, we just kind of assumed for a long time in, in psychology that they weren't experiencing emotions in the same way. Mm -hmm. We learned that's like, that's totally, Fake news, right? It's not a real thing. Um, they actually are really experiencing that. They just may not be expressing it out lately. Oh, so, yeah, the idea was like, let's use these skills we know work really well for people with emotional regulation and offer them to a more general population um, with the idea being the focus on skills rather than like the fully adherent DBT program. For some of whom uh, that's a good fit for people with psychosis and for others, it may not fit You know, the resources they have access to uh, you know, housing insecurity, food insecurity are common amongst people with psychosis and attending a full program is just maybe not meant for them at times. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, that makes, I mean, it's fantastic that you can even dig this kind of information up through research and that bring, kind of shine a spotlight on these misconceptions, you know, within, within the mental health field itself and, and a lot of these assumptions we have about people with psychosis, right? 
take a different approach than just medication alone, right? Yeah, exactly. And one of the really wonderful things that's happened, I think, in the past probably you know two decades or so, is that we've seen the emergence of cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis or CBT for psychosis, mm-hmm. and seeing again more literature and a more reliance. I think less so in the U.S. but more abroad. And we've seen a lot in Australia and the U.K. where they're using these approaches really actively with folks with psychosis and seeing really wonderful outcomes around quality of life in particular. Mm-hmm. So helping people, you know, be able to challenge their own thoughts or kind of distortions that are coming up, as well as accepting and dealing with their symptoms differently, right? That you can live a healthy, happy life and still hear voices, for example. Um, I think that's something that we haven't really considered to be like normal, quote unquote, in society in a lot of places. Right. Absolutely. You know, we understand it as normal. We know there's a spectrum, right? Between disorganized schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder, right? We know that the difference somebody with schizoaffective disorder is going to have a lot higher capacity to engage with the world and and push through and and make things work in spite of the back burner psychosis they're more tripped up by the the front end mood dysregulation stuff you know versus somebody who's you know disorganized and doesn't have the capacity so i'm wondering with with these skills is in the workbook where's the point of um, implementation when you're working with clients in what kind of context would this be used, do you think? Yeah, um, in terms of uh, the actual workbook itself, so it's really designed for people with psychosis. Like it's written in language that is directly for somebody who's experiencing these symptoms themselves. And one of the things that's cool about that is that there aren't any other books on the market that are designed specifically for this group. Because again, a lot of misconceptions about like do people with psychosis read? Absolutely. But we didn't really know that, or excuse me, we knew that for a long time, but people made assumptions that that wasn't true. So I think part of how I use the workbook, um, and I've noticed a lot of people have told me that they're using the workbook now that it's out, is either you know using it on their own, particularly in conjunction with loved ones. So you know, starting to do exercises and share with somebody else to be like, this is what was helpful for me. Like, can you remind me to use this when I'm in crisis? Or, you know, there's certain things that are designed really to be used with people who you trust in your life. And I'm also seeing a lot of people who are bringing into therapy with them. I've gotten lots of really just very heartwarming notes from people experiencing psychosis who've written me to be like, I brought this into therapy so we can go through it together. You know, I'm using it with my mom. I'm using it with, you know, my sister, whoever, as a way to really, um, bolster the things that they're already doing with really the focus not just on um you know stopping symptomatic because that's not actually really the, the point of the book the point is really like build a life worth living where you feel like you can thrive and move towards your goals and the things that you love and work out where psychosis falls into that as having a chronic condition wow and i love that that it's designed to be in the hands of the client and the consumer and their families as a tool for self-determination as opposed to a therapist just saying, okay, here's this handout. I want you to work on X, Y, and Z or more, it's less prescriptive and it's more self, you know, self-help, but can also be used as a tool throughout therapy as a collaboration tool, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the interesting parts is I didn't know when I wrote the book exactly how it would be used. I had kind of a vision in my mind and then People just started writing me to talk to me about how it had been useful and where they'd used it and things that they'd like to see better or changed or whatever. And that was really a common thread was I like I want to use this with other people. And so I definitely am encouraging people to say, like, you know, find who you can share this with. And if it's too private, you know, it could be your own as well. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. a lot of the tools, you know, we know are useful in DBT that are in this workbook also work really well for caregivers, right? Like if you're somebody who's supporting right. somebody that with psychosis, sense. yeah, you want to be able to like. Um, self-soothe, you want to be able to use the tip skill, you want to be able to use these things that help you manage your emotions when you're struggling as well dealing with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I use a tip skill a lot. That skill is fantastic. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so just circling back, I mean, you just kind of brushed by the fact that you're trained in CBT for trauma or psychosis, I should say. Mm -hmm. Um, Was that part of of the experience that led you to writing this, do you think? Is your experience doing that first or was it DBT and then CBD for psychosis? 
So I probably got trained in a way that's similar to how a lot of people who end up doing therapy do, where I got trained, you know, in CBT as soon as I got to grad school. Like that was kind of the bread and butter of most things in mm-hmm. BBT I sort of opted into. And so I got trained specifically in CBT for psychosis during grad school because I think it was really up and coming at that time, about a decade ago, where we were trying to implement this more in the United States and make sure people have access to it. In my clinic in particular, I was getting trained at, was really excited about like, we need to offer people therapy in addition to medication management for folks struggling with psychosis. And so I definitely, there was kind of like a a dual path, but I didn't really start using DBT skills for people with psychosis probably until a few years in. when one of my mentors encouraged me to say like, why are we pretending like these are two totally separate worlds when there's so much overlap of folks between the two. Um, and so I love CBT for psychosis. It's definitely like the foundation of what I've done and, and my work. And I think one of the nice things about the DBT skills is that they fit in really nicely, right? Because CBT is really focused on cognitions, changing the way we're thinking, et cetera. And one of the things that sometimes is lacking from that is, okay, like how do I deal with the emotional overwhelm that's happening where I can't the focus crisis. yet on it? Yeah. Exactly. And so that's, that's kind of how those two, I think, really like uh, form a really nice union together. Because life is messy, right? I mean, we don't always have the opportunity <laughs> to say, wait, 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 hold on. Let me journal this real quick. Let me <laughs> break this down. Where's the evidence? You know, let me challenge this thought. No, because life is happening at the speed of life, mm-hmm. right? And so I think that's, that's the biggest challenge with CBT alone is it takes a lot of practice and a lot of time to get to the point where you can catch yourself in real time. Right. So just echoing what you said about DBT skills, those are a lot of those are designed as crisis survival skills. Like in the moment I'm panicking, what do I do? What's going to bring me down enough that I can start to assess the situation. Right. Exactly. Right. Like I think of it as like, how can I think clearly enough to like know how, how I need to act in this situation or what decision to make Um, Mm -hmm. sort of like the idea of the distress tolerance skills of DBT of like get through a uh, difficult skills, moment right? without doing yeah. something to make it worse. Like, let me yeah. get through it without like causing another fire to go out and or to to erupt. And mm-hmm. I think, in particular, what I notice with people with psychosis is there is an urgency that's there to intervene, right? Because um, rates of self harm and of suicide are so high amongst people with psychosis, as well mm-hmm. as heavy drug use. We need to find things that are going to help them intervene. So that they can choose a different option than some of those ones that might be potentially harmful or come with consequences for them in the long term. Right. Because this population, just like every other population, does not exist in a vacuum. It's layered, right? Like you said, substance use and co-occurring disorders, right? Exactly. DPT skills, I imagine, work for a lot of those things simultaneously. You can apply them across multiple domains, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very good. Very good. So I imagine a lot of your life, your work life is absorbed, you know, and promoting this book, applying this book. What else do you see your time going to in in terms of your multiple hats you wear, trainer, consultant, therapy? Yeah, well, that's what I'm looking at right now is figuring out kind of what that path looks like. And I think right now, the thing that has made me, I think, feel most and excited and alive recently is providing trainings to people in the community um, and really helping people, particularly early in their career as mental health clinicians, as well as later on to say, like, let's get you these tools now so you can be developing them um, because you've got, you know, many years potentially doing this work. And um I think what that's looked like for me is doing trainings with places across the country. One of the great things of, well, one of the few upsides I should say about COVID is kind of the access to this virtual world where mm-hmm. I've been able to give trainings. I just trained the um, city of Chicago in DBT for psychosis, an uh, organization in Utah, in New York, being able to have access to the places that I wouldn't otherwise just by virtue of this book, um, as well as the virtual world. So for me, that's been a really exciting prospect of getting people trained as clinicians in this. Um, I'm also writing a book chapter for a different book about novel approaches to psychosis that's coming out of, it'll be published in Spain. So it'll be an international book in English and Spanish. And it's really the opportunity again to say, let's get creative in our interventions with psychosis. And here's how we use DBT to do that specifically. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's definitely a whole uh, new world with COVID having opened up things like telehealth, which was kind of on the fringe before, you know, not so well accepted. Now it's the norm online learning. Yeah. So 
it's, it's there's some silver lining right, with COVID is that you're you can educate more people, help more people. Yeah. Yeah, it's starting to feel that way, definitely. So you've done a lot. You're doing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think you would like to take things next? Like as you're, you know, as you're as you close the chapter, maybe you can relax a little bit on this because you've just finished this giant thing and you're doing the trainings. Where do you think you'll be leaning in? I know you said you're working on another book. Yeah, so I am, I think, really looking right now at training as like my biggest kind of field. So I'm still doing my like full-time job working with folks with psychosis um, and doing gender specialty work at a clinic, which I just love. And one of the really cool parts of my role there is I run a training program. So for people who are just fresh out of grad school who are um, postmasters fellows who will spend a year with us training. That's, I think, one of my biggest passions is doing supervision and training people who are new to the field and really trying to put my energy and effort into um, using that sort of social justice lens of doing this work. But I think I had some training when I was in grad school, but probably not nearly as much for what the world looks like now. Mm -hmm. So trying to really train a class um, where we are talking really actively about like, how do we uh, do anti-racist work as social workers? What's our history of social workers that hasn't been so pretty and how can we do better? Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about how we're integrating those principles in, and also again, taking that disability justice lens to kind of teach them around what is, what's normal, right? Like how do we even define some of these things when we're working in a medical model and the difference between people's lived experience and then what the DSM tells us about that. So kind of, I think, mm -hmm from that perspective of doing training with people who are newer to the field. And, and really, I think for me, um, using some of their energy, right? Like the excitement that they bring in of people who are you know, not jaded yet to uh, have a you know, really important part and who are excited yeah. and who have new ideas and really being able to harness some of that for myself to feel excited about the work I'm doing. Well, certainly, I mean, I can relate to that. You know, I remember when I was coming out of grad school and you just don't understand I didn't understand the lay of the land and all of the different avenues you can go down in social work and mental health, you know, and what that looks like, because yeah, once you land, I mean, you're excited to land into a clinic and get a job right out mm -hmm. of school. And then, but you, and you spend all your time getting your hours and you're trained in, you know, what you're allowed to be trained in and what you're told you know, to work with and the population you're given, be that children or adults or older adults or the homeless, you know, field-based and um, do that for a while. And, but if that's all your experience is in, you know, there's an opportunity cost if you don't know what other options are out there, mm -hmm. right? Or how else you can apply or like you, like you were just saying, like a lot of the social justice that causes that social work was founded upon oftentimes are, you know, kind of fall into the shadows if we don't understand what our options are, you know, other than just lobbying. So that's, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're passionate about that. And it shows in the way you talk about it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it is definitely the thing that gets me most excited these days. And you know, I think for myself personally, the reason that I really chose social work over other professions was the idea that I could move between kind of these very micro levels like I'm working on or in terms of my you know, individual client work to more of the macro level kind of activism type of work, which is where I came from before I did all of this. Mm -hmm. And then down to the meso level, which to me is like my book, right? As an example, like of mm -hmm. ways that we kind of can um, influence change and do work on all these different levels and particularly keeping all of those contexts in mind when we work with somebody or work with a community. And for me as somebody who I think gets um, bored easily. Like I like to be learning. I like to be growing. I really love social work for that reason, that it gives me the ability to kind of move between things and, um, you know, just find different things that I can be excited about and feel like I'm making a change on when I get burnt out in certain things in different areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You seem very good about throttling and knowing how to move between passions and keep those things alive. And I, that's such an important part of mental health in general. People who oftentimes end up feeling unhappy, it's because there's nothing to stimulate them or they're neglecting a part of their themselves or what's important. Um, there's no, you know, with the more autonomy it seems you, you, you lose, the easier it is to kind of get stuck in a rut, even professionally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, to mention, you know, before I got into social work or graduate school, any of this, I was really doing kind of community based activist work. And 
for me, I think one of the things that I noticed was how burned out how quickly I got doing that work because I didn't have um, I think the tools or the understanding of like, how do you take care of yourself when you're doing this work? It feels literally nonstop, right? Like anything in social work too, there's kind of a sense of like, there's so much done. Like, and I, I want to do all of it. I think that's a lot of mm-hmm. why we get into this field in the first place is that we want to help our communities. We want to make a big difference. But the pacing part being so critical that I think I've learned with like many other people the hard way where you kind of hit a wall at various times doing things. Um, mm-hmm. And for a long time, I was doing work uh, in the prison system and really feeling like I was seeing a lot of really regularly traumatic things, the way people were getting treated and the way the institution was talking about people. And I didn't really have, I think, quite the robust understanding of how that would impact me personally as just somebody who's going in and helping people. And so I think I have really appreciated doing this work where I feel like I have more understanding, more training, I can really can pass that on to the next generation of people who are becoming therapists or social workers or kind of change agents in some way to be like, you know, here are the things I've experienced that'll be different than yours, but here's what to look out for with, um, you know, burnout and uh, secondary traumatization and all those things that I think are kind of the hazards of our field. That must be so rewarding, you know, to be able to, to be in a position to give people a heads up, you know, new clinicians, you know, watch out for this pothole, watch out for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because those are serious things. Absolutely. Burnout is a, is a huge, huge issue in this field. So if you can help people get ahead of it, you know, that's fantastic. And, you know, I, I envy you, you know, I certainly have a passion for helping what, you know, new clinicians would be clinicians as part of my whole mental health toolbox project, mm-hmm. you know, is to kind of help consumers or would be consumers, but also clinicians, you know, and help them avoid avoidable suffering right mm. so they can show up as them their best selves and and serve to their best ability right so thank yeah. you for the work you do it's definitely dear to my heart yeah i love the way you put that too to avoid un, uh unnecessary suffering is that what you yeah. said yeah yeah avoid avoidable suffering Absolutely. i love that yeah. yeah there's no need to burn out you know there's no need you know and the first thing i teach you you know in what graduate school is you know Focus on the small wins. It's like they're preparing you for you know, <laughs> on to those. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of um, unpleasant stories we we take on to understand the context. That's a big part of being a therapist, is on the micro levels to you to really understand to the best of our ability. Not that we can ever walk in somebody else's shoes, but to really get perspective, we have to hear the details we have to absorb that and mentally process what that looks like in order to look for points of intervention to help people understand where a coping skill might fit and what's not going to work right absolutely yeah that takes a lot of mental ram too you know <laughs> yeah another good way to put it yes and then to turn around yeah. and practice what we preach you know that's a whole other thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually one of the things that I like most about DBT is that, um, you know, being part of a DBT team, there is a uh, inherent focus on the idea that you need to use these skills because you're doing hard work, essentially, and you will be a crappy provider if you do not take care of yourself. And so I really like that personally, the accountability to be like, I have a team that I'm going to go like see every week who will ask me things like, how's your mindfulness practice? Like, are you using your distress tolerance skills? Like, what are you basically just holding me accountable to not burning myself out and, and, and yes. what can come with that. That's one of my favorite parts, facets of the DBT structure is the group consultation with the other clinicians because of the accountability mm-hmm. and supporting each other, you know, and checking in. Um, I feel like in my, in my experience, no other EVP really has that. You know, in, in the terms mm-hmm. of that, that group support, and it's easily, easily missed if you don't make, it, make an effort to seek it out via supervision or otherwise. Um, yeah. yeah. You're getting your hours, that. you have the group supervision, but then, that's, you know, after you're, you're done getting licensed, that's not really a thing. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't actually really thought about that before, but I think you make a really uh, smart point, which is the idea that I don't know that there are other treatments that are really as focused on, you know, in DBT, we talk about like providing therapy for the therapist, mm-hmm. right? Like being the, the using DBT skills to treat DBT problems essentially in those consultation mm-hmm. teams. And I really value that. I think that's like one of the big parts that's gotten me through doing hard work with 
really challenging situations or challenging you know behaviors that come up with clients is mm-hmm. having people I can rely on and kind of fall back on. And I think that's really wonderful and unique part of DBT and it's a very um, shared responsibility too, because I don't yeah. my experience we traded off leading the groups and co-leading the groups and everybody had at least one or two of their own clients, you know, and so it was it was mm-hmm. as very much joint effort. And even the way groups are run, it's not like it's a therapist talking at the consumers. It's we are talking and working on this together. And it's a very a lot of camaraderie, a lot of all in the same boat mentality. I think really mm-hmm. makes it work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. You can't tell I'm a big fan of DBT. So. <laughs> I'm very into it. Um, any other passions that maybe people don't know about, at least not on your professional side? Oh, what a good question. Um, there are a lot of things I'm excited about. And like, it, you can probably tell just by how excited I get about many things. I'm like a, I'm a very shiny person, like a shiny <laughs> object person, yeah, where I get very excited. Yeah. <laughs> Not about um, but I would say the things that I've been most excited about recently uh, are really doing gender specialty work. I mean, in terms of mm-hmm. like my professional life, like as a non-binary person, it feels so exciting to be able to like provide representation to my community and the folks that I'm serving in that regard. So that's been, I think, one really exciting thing that I've been working on and trying to grow a bit more. Um, I think the thing personally for me that's been the most exciting is like dance, actually. It's been the thing I think that has um, helped me maintain my mental health the last few mm-hmm. years, almost above anything else, is just having the space to exercise, like have a community of people that I'm doing an act- a shared activity with and um, it's also really challenging for my brain to learn choreography and do certain things like that. So it's, it's a very, very scalable fun. passion, right? Because there's always something it's like cooking. There's always something new to learn. Exactly. Plus you've got the activity. That's fantastic. It's yeah. nice. Fancy. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Personal care. Personal yes. development. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, and the part that I do personally is like I sort of moved away from like more serious stance and have really just been doing um, these classes that are about like learning the choreography of pop stars. And it's just like really fun to be able to do something that's totally absurd and like also like very fun to get into. And like that's the type of stuff I encourage my clients to get into is like it doesn't matter that like it's odd to other people or whatever. It's really about like using this fun you can let loose and mm-hmm. really participate in to use kind of dbt language mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um to really in the get moment. moment enjoy yeah. it yeah yeah i could use that advice i'm the wallflower yeah I the <laughs> i'm the guy going to get another glass of punch we all have a role patrick <laughs> <laughs> all right um anything we didn't touch on that you feel is important for um, our listeners, nuggets of wisdom, maybe for both the consumer and the practitioner, takeaway points that if there's nothing else they remember from this interview that you would have them walk away with. I think maybe the biggest piece right now that I'm working to sort of like educate people about is really the um, idea of normalizing talking about mental health, but in particular like severe mental illness. So not just talking about depression, anxiety, which I think are really things our society is doing a lot better on recently, but thinking about um, people who are also experiencing more active, more impairing type of symptoms who have uh, more distress that comes from their uh, experience overall, and kind of more chronic conditions, and really thinking about it from the perspective of again, people with psychosis and people who have a poor disorder, kind of, again, these more chronic severe mental health issues to be the ones who are leading the way around this. And part of our role as therapists or as mental health providers to be to listen to that, right? To really take that seriously and not to kind of write off as, I don't know, delusional behavior or some of the things that we might've done in the past and really kind of let those voices lead. So for me, I think my, my biggest goal is like listening to people who are having that experience and being able to integrate that into my work in a much more active way and having that be a really active voice there. Yeah, I love that. I remember a train I took years ago. It was called Listening with Psychotic Ears. Hmm. It was very much to that effect as being being careful to watch your own implicit bias and not just label something as a particular behavior and, and be passive about it, but really to, to try and figure out what that's about. You know, what does yeah. that mean to the, the consumer? Mm-hmm. Why is that showing up now or in this situation? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think just more inclusion of people with psychosis is kind of the general theme for me recently is thinking about like 
how do we have people as stakeholders, right? So as we're mentioning, kind of integrate them into the work we're doing, taking them seriously. And um, also I think just thinking about like, that we do have options for people with psychosis that are within our wheelhouse that we can provide and not be scared of that, right? Like I think as clinicians, sometimes we get afraid of things that we can't define or can't put our finger on or there's higher mm -hmm. risk issues, but putting mm -hmm. this like other mental health issues that we can treat and that are manageable as well. And people can have a life worth living and have a hopeful yeah. future. Absolutely. We got to get a, on a whole soapbox about, you know, facilitating more time and space to work on these things, even within clinic settings. Yeah. Absolutely. Group settings, <laughs> yeah. staffing, the whole bit, you know, caseloads and <laughs> mm -hmm. different conversation. Um, of all the DBT skills, and what do you feel would be the most, are the most maybe effective in helping with mood regulation in your experience? Mm, it's hard to choose just one because uh, DBT skills really do stack on top of each other. Mm. That's one of the great parts. You have to be mindful in order to yes. know you need a skill, that type Dear of thing. Your man, give fast, problem solving, communication, crisis exactly. skills, stop. I know, I know they break it up pretty good <laughs> by name, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Context. I think, you know, maybe the way I'll answer that question that's a bit different than how you asked it is actually maybe the skill that I think my clients find the most fun and they're most willing to use. Um, because I think sometimes what I have to do is get people to buy into using what I'm offering before they're willing to do it. And I often start with skills that are a little bit more, um, I don't know, I think that are more engaging to people. So like, I love all the stress tolerance skills. I love all of our emotion regulation skills and some of them are a little heavier. So I often will start with people around a skill like alternate rebellion, which I think is really, um, again, a fun skill uh, in the sense of the, the idea being that like for many people, we rebel against society in some way or the other, right? Like either sure. we're yeah. rebelling against boredom, against conformity around our diagnosis. Like there's always something that we're kind of rebelling against. And the idea is that a lot of people end up using drugs as a way to rebel because mm -hmm. they kind of want to give like an FU to society, to somebody telling them what to do, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but we also engage in other harm, kind of harmful to ourselves behaviors that are not just drug use, right? So like um, self-isolation, right, being a big one amongst people, or mm -hmm. um, self-harm, or, you know, a number of other things, and so I often will work on my clients by saying, okay, the way you're rebelling is coming with some consequences, right, let's say it's like, I don't know, alcohol use, mm -hmm. so let's instead find something that still allows you to get that, like, fun, rebellious spirit out, but without so many consequences, so, like, let's Ooh, find like something that. creative, right, yeah. like, um, it could be, uh, you know, going to a protest, dyeing your hair a different color, getting a piercing, uh, getting a, a temporary, I need to say temporary tattoo to start, mm -hmm. just for, for that kind of impulsivity that can come up. Yeah, a little Hannah um, tattoo or something. <laughs> yeah, uh, we could be working, like I had one client for whom like her way of rebelling against her partner was to pee in the shower. Like that was like her very simple thing that was like a way of being, like F you, but like right? zero consequences ultimately. Mm -hmm. No one knew. My harm reduction, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and I actually think this is really a harm reduction skill. You just named that well because it is about really reducing the harm associated with certain behaviors and finding things that can still get that like awesome, really important to harness rebellious spirit out in a way that's going to come with um, fewer negative consequences ultimately. So I think that's one of the ways that I sometimes get my clients into doing this, particularly with people like maybe teens or people who are maybe a little more hesitant to engage with me around DBT and then kind of work with other stuff from there um, once they're bought in. I love it. I love it. It reminds me of that um, a hierarchy of, you know, you help people find what they want so you can lead them to what they need, right? I love it. Yeah. All right. So um, where can our listeners find more out about you? Where can they go to learn more about Maggie? Yeah, so definitely my website, which is maggiemullen.com is a great place to start. Um, you can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram at maggiemullenlcsw. I'm also on Goodreads as an author there. Um, and those are probably the easiest ways to get in touch with me as well as LinkedIn as well. Beautiful website, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. Very nice. <laughs> Nicely polished. Um, your book, where can people find it? Oh yeah. So anywhere you buy your books, so Amazon, good, uh, you know, bookshop.com, um, any of those websites, 
uh, is fine, as well as like your local bookstore, you can request from there, you can request from your local library, wherever you want to get it. Um, there's a link on my website to it, but it's again, the DDT skills workbook for psychosis. Fantastic. All right. Well, I'll be sure to link up to all of that in the description, et cetera, podcast, blog, YouTube, wherever you happen to be absorbing this from. Um, any Anything you'd like to add? Any questions, comments, concerns? No, I really appreciate the work you're doing, Patrick, right. for having me on today and excited to be sharing your mental health toolbox resources with, with oh, the folks I'm working with. Thank you. Too. Yes, I'm sure this will be a gem for our listeners. Thank you so much for your time. And would it be okay if I did a follow-up down the road? See how things are going on in your world? Of course, yeah. All right. Great. Thank you so much. I'll be uh, checking in with you and, uh, you know, down the road, see how things are going. And feel free to reach out anytime, okay? Thank you, Patrick. Really appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Another tool to help you thrive. Hey, if you're getting value from this content and you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe, like, and share. It helps us reach more people to raise mental health awareness. All right, now go make good things happen. Bye-bye. Travel